This is based on the Miami Waterkeeper uh, Junior Ambassador Program. Um, my name is Ramya. I'm the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Cuba Skin Community Foundation. Uh, before I get into that, uh, we are going to be introduced by the mayor. She's going to talk about the village's um, efforts at sustainability and environmental awareness. And then I'll talk about our program, and then we'll go to Kelly with Miami Waterkeeper. Uh, so we, we can get into the whole ambassador program. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome, and thank you so much for coming out here so early in the morning. So one of the things that I love about you all in our community is that uh, we have for a very long time been concerned about sustainability, about our environment, and we've been very vocal and active about it. Um, Key Biscayne, for the last 50 years, has been incredibly innovative. Um, we are surrounded by water, we love our water, and we value the, our quality of life and the, the impacts of having um, good environmental policies. We also have acted as a model in, uh, for other communities, whether it's through citizen scientists, which has been transformative, partnerships with water keepers, with residents just going out and doing beach cleanups. You know, this weekend, uh, we, we have been doing just community-driven water clean, uh, beach cleanups on a regular basis. This weekend, we had a big one over at Bill Bags. Um, I am glad you're here. I am glad we have such an interested uh, residents who are engaged, who uh, want to impart their wisdom, and who also want to serve as a model and a role up to what should be done. Um, and what we need to do, what policies are good for our sustainability. Uh, the village has, for you know, our 25 years of incorporation, been really proactive about uh, sea level rise and really the impact of large storms and how we build resiliency. We are very concerned about what's going on in the environment. We are concerned about our overfished um, oceans and our water quality and the bleaching of our um, corals out it because it's indications that we need to do better. So thank you for taking the time for being here, informing yourselves, and collaborating to do better for all of Miami-Dade County. Thank you all very much for doing this. We appreciate the programming. We enjoy it and we learn so much. Thank you. Enjoy. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Lindsay, for coming. We really appreciate it. Um, so, as I said, uh, my name is Ramya. I'm the Citizen Science Coordinator for the Keep Biscayne Community Foundation and our Citizen Science Project. Um, we have a number of different projects that we work on throughout the year. Uh, this is um, based on an EPA grant that we received last year. It's a two-year grant, so it's going through August of next year. And it is based specifically on uh, doing water quality and shoreline conservation. And it's an environmental education grant. So it's specifically uh, environmentally based, and it has to involve education of the public and schools and anywhere, basically, that we can do it. Um, we're working with a number of different partners, including Miami Waterkeeper. Uh, we have Dream and Green, the Ask Club uh, here locally, um, Bill Bags, uh, the Biscayne Nature Center, and a few others, University of Miami next door. Um, and we, we're trying to come up with a, a, as many different um, events and projects and uh, lectures um, workshops that we can um, to try to get as many people from the key involved and educated regarding the different uh, um, issues that our that our environment is facing right now. Um, as Mayor Lindsay mentioned, you know the pollution, plastic in the oceans. Um, a lot of that comes in with as far as the EPA grant, the shoreline conservation. Um, we have beach cleanups uh, every month. Bill Bag says uh, beach cleanup. Um, we uh, we've been sponsoring those for the for the last year. Um, Miami Waterkeeper has their, their regular junior ambassador program, and this one is based on that program, but as you can see, it's open to everybody, not just uh, juniors, kids. Um, and and it, it comes to the same ends, you know, so we, we want everyone to have environmental awareness and, like, understand what's going on. Um, the second uh, workshop in this series uh, focuses on um, civic engagement, you know, talking to policymakers, sending them letters so that, you know, you can engage and let them know, like, you know, I think that this issue is important and we should address it. Um, and then the third session in August will be, we have one each month, the third session in August will be about environmental stakeholders. So, you know, who is it that is concerned about the, these different uh, issues that we're looking at? 
um, and how it affects them specifically. Um, obviously, for, for as an example, when you um, institute certain fishing re regulations, you have both recreational and commercial fishermen who are stakeholders, and they want to know, like, how is this regulation going to affect me? So just as an example. Uh, we also have um, other programs like the Key Challenge that we do throughout the school year, and that is basically, it's essentially like an extended science fair, and we get all the schools on the Key involved, and they work on their different projects throughout the year, and then turn them into us at the end of the, the school year. We have uh, judging and then awards, and um, in this case, uh, the last year was based specifically on water quality or water environments, uh, so that way it falls directly under our EPA grant. And we were able to extend it also by giving subgrants to the schools to make, um, you know, to get them more interested, to get more teachers involved, and to make it so that they can actually give their students more opportunities because with the subgrants they can afford more materials and, um, you know, field trips and things like that. And um, we also do uh, monthly lectures, um, not so much during the summer, but uh, during the school year again. And these are all environmentally science based lectures. Um, last year we had one on invasive um, lionfish, uh, coral reef restoration. Um, we had uh, one about citizen science using this app called iNaturalist, which is really fun and I'm kind of obsessed with it. Um, you basically just take pictures of plants and animals and you can post them in the app and then people help identify them. And well, one of the most interesting things about it, the way it's a citizen science program, is that researchers will use these pictures that have been identified um, and if they're looking for a specific type of lizard in a certain area and they want to know its habits, um, it shows the, the, the place where you took the picture, the time, and um, it may or may not include the temperature, I can't remember. But, but basically they can be like, oh, there's this lizard that I'm studying and it's out at night and I didn't know it was nocturnal. You know? And then they can get ideas of populations and, and you know, just a lot of different characteristics. And all they have to do is just say, I'm studying this area, and then all the different pictures that people have taken within that area of that specific animal will pop up. And it's become extremely helpful for a lot of different researchers that are looking at uh, different plants and animals. Um, let's see, we had another um, lecture about uh, the, uh, the drift card, the um, Bay Drift um, project that's being done at Rasmus, where um, they're studying the, the currents around Biscayne Bay. And the reason that they started that was actually because of the Deep Horizon oil spill. Um, Karth, was, Karth is a program over at Rasmus. They were working with different universities to look at how the oil actually spreads over water, where it's going to end up, how it's going to move. And uh, when the, uh, the county found out that they were doing this project, they asked them to look at how the water moves in Biscayne Bay. Because a lot of our um, you know, storm water drains, some sewage, things like that. It's all just dumped in the bay with the idea that it'll be dispersed and diluted. And what they found so far is that basically the water just circulates in the bay. <laughs> Very little of it actually travels outside into the Atlantic. Um, so hopefully that's something that they can, you know, work on so the bay doesn't get disgusting. Um, and anyway, so you get the idea. Basically, we, we try to look at all the different aspects of the environment. Um, you know, get everybody engaged as much as possible and give them as much awareness and, you know, hopefully cultivate some interest. And, uh, you know, so we're hoping that we can get more participation. Um, hopefully we can do a similar series next summer, we'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, we hope that you guys can come to the other two. There's one in early July and one in early August. And uh, I have uh, flyers with the schedule. If you want one, just come see me after it's over. And uh, with that, I will hand it off to you, Kelly, and you can talk about my new Yes. You were talking about the water being stagnant in the bay. It, it's not that it's stagnant. It's just that um, the water that, or the storm water that's dumped in there, it doesn't really leave the bay. I mean, the bay is huge, but but it is it stays within the bay for the most part. It doesn't, not very much of it actually goes out. But to I the always Atlanta. thought there were currents that came into the bay. There are currents that come in and go out, but um, if you're dumping like from the mainland, that actually tends to stay closer to the mainland. It doesn't necessarily go all the way out to the other side of the bay. And and again, it's not like. 100% of the water stays in the bay. There is movement, but basically the dilution that happens is very slow. Um, so depending on how much you know water we're putting in or, or pollution is getting into the bay, it may build up faster than it's being diluted. Kelly. My name is Kelly and I'm actually the staff attorney and program director at Miami Waterkeeper. And Miami Waterkeeper is a local 501c3 nonprofit organization based here in Miami. And we're part of what's called the Greater Waterkeeper Alliance, which is 
uh, a collective of over 300 organizations worldwide that work to make sure our water is swimmable, drinkable, and fishable. Now those words might sound a little catchy and familiar, and that's because those are rights that are given to you under the Clean Water Act. We all have the right to swim in clean water, we have the right to fish from clean water, and we have the right to drink clean water. And so what waterkeeper organizations do across the globe is they use advocacy, uh, including legal advocacy where necessary, and outreach and education to make sure that those rights are protected for the citizens that live in our respective watersheds. So Miami Waterkeeper is the organization that's here in South Florida in Broward and Dade County, and we're looking out for your water here in Miami and Broward. Um, and we do that in a number of ways, right? So we have three primary issues that we focus on. We focus on sea level rise resiliency. We focus on clean water itself, drinking water, aquifer health, and that type of thing. Um, and of course, we focus on ecosystem protection. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those things today. So as I mentioned, we're part of the Greater Waterkeeper Alliance. And this is actually a really fun story that I always like to tell uh, about how this movement was created. So back in the 1960s, uh, there was a group of commercial fishermen and ex-marines that were working in factories and plants along the Hudson River and in New York. New York, for those of you who don't know where the Hudson River is, uh, in New York. And they started to notice that their fishery populations in the river were declining dramatically. And the fish that they were catching were really unhealthy and probably unsafe to eat. And so they started doing a little bit of research to figure out why it turned out that the city of New York was dumping 1.5 billion, with a B, gallons of raw sewage into the Hudson every day. They also found out that the railway companies along the Hudson were dropping oil directly into the Hudson River. And finally, they realized that the plants, the industrial plants located alongside the river, such as a GM car manufacturing plant, were dumping paint residue and manufacturing um, components directly into the river as well. And the old story goes uh, that you could tell what color cars were being painted at the GM plant based on the type or the color of the fish that were pulled out of the Hudson. Okay. So it's a pretty dramatic impact that the Hudson was seeing, and the, the decline in the health of the river was pretty dramatic. And so these fishermen got together and they said, you know, this is not just affecting my livelihood at this point, this is affecting the health of my children and my family. I'm not able to provide for them because of these people that are hurting a common resource, the Hudson River. So they got together in the early 1960s and they decided, you know, we have to do something about this. They approached the different uh, groups, the different polluting groups, and of course the polluting group said, oh, we don't have, we don't have any obligation to do anything that you say. And so the fishermen decided that they were going to sue them. And they sued them under a very old statute from 1888 called the Rivers and Harbors Act and the Refuse Act from, 19, from 1889, the following year. And for the first time in recorded history, uh, a bounty was given to the fishermen for degradation of their water resource, the Hudson River, based on these really old statutes. And thus, the environmental movement around clean water advocacy was sort of born. It was like the, the birth of this movement. And over the next 20 years, the fishermen organized more and more. And by the 1980s, they formed what was called the Hudson River Keeper. And with their bounty, which was a $2,000 bounty, that's how much they received back in the 1960s for all this pollution that was happening to their common resource. With that $2,000, they bought a patrol boat and they decided, you know, we need to go around and hold these polluters accountable. So we're going to patrol the Hudson. And that's exactly what they did. And that's what they still do to this day. And by the 1990s, other people started to catch on to this model. And they said, you know, this is a really good model to protect our resources. And by the 1990s, of course, we had um, the growth of environmental laws in this country. So we started to see the surfacing of the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act the National Environmental Policy Act, numerous acts that were sought to protect public health and the environment. And so they started to use these statutes uh, to do just that. These statutes are really unique, right? Because they have what's called a citizen suit provision in the statutes. And the citizen suit provision 
essentially gives any citizen, all of you sitting in this room, anyone who uses the water or any resource to bring a lawsuit against a polluter to hold them accountable. And so what these waterkeeper organizations and the riverkeeper organizations did was they started to bring lawsuits on behalf of their membership. They started to bring lawsuits on behalf of the fishermen, on behalf of the families, on behalf of the tourism industry, you name it, they started to bring lawsuits. And they started to win because there was severe degradation, as I said, of the Hudson River and other, other watersheds throughout the United States. And today, this movement has caught on like wildfire, right? So we have over 300 waterkeeper organizations worldwide considered the fastest growing environmental movement across the globe. And that's something that's really important because we create this alliance of organizations that uh, basically creates a common resource for everybody to use and citizens know that they can approach keeper groups and report incidences of pollution and then they can report um, other problems that they're seeing in their watershed and they know that the keeper groups have the ability and the capacity to represent their best interests for their water resources. And that's what we do here in Miami um, on the issue areas that I spoke about. So in particular, we use community outreach and education, scientific research and legal advocacy uh, to make sure that these three things are protected for all of you. So today, I'm gonna give a little bit of an overview of the environmental conditions that we're dealing with right now in South Florida with a focus on the, the area around the village of Key Biscayne, given our, our geographic area right now. I'm gonna talk about environmental challenges and the future outlook, so what we can do to help solve these problems. Biscayne Bay, as Romeo was saying, is a lot bigger than we realize. So I live in South Miami and part of the time I think you know, Biscayne Bay is just this little area by Matheson Hammock. But the reality is, is that Biscayne Bay is really big. And it's protected by what's called a barrier island, right? So we have all these barrier islands. In fact, we are sitting on a barrier island right now. And these barrier islands create a bay, which is a shallow estuary area um, that's a mix of fresh and salt water. And the bay extends all the way north. It actually extends a little bit farther than what's pictured on this map. And it extends all the way down to Card Sound, down by Turkey Point Nuclear Power Plant in Homestead. And that's technically the boundaries of Biscayne Bay, but the, the bay ecosystem does extend beyond those direct boundaries, of course. So as I was saying, the estuary that we have in the bay is um, really, really important. And because estuaries mix salt and fresh water, they create this interesting mix of brackish water, which is a really, really easy habitat for species to live and grow and thrive in. So once you get out into the open ocean, things get a lot saltier. Conditions get a lot rougher. It's harder for species to survive. But the bay creates this barrier, this protective area where conditions, uh, superficial water conditions are a lot nicer. Uh, temperature is a lot more stable, there's less wave action and current action, and of course the salinity is lower, which makes a difference for different species. It's one of the most productive ecosystems in our area for those ecological reasons. The freshwater flow that comes down from the Everglades, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, because um, we do have some existing environmental challenges related to freshwater flow, but the freshwater flow comes down from the Everglades and flushes down into the bay and throughout all of South Florida. Slowly it flushes and it brings nutrients from inland areas, of course. Um, and as you can see, this is a perfect example of how water goes in and out of the bay uh, from freshwater areas to saltwater areas. Um, plants use these nutrients, corals use these nutrients, different animal species use these nutrients, and they're, they're important for the nutrient cycling throughout the ecosystem. For the bay is an area where uh, different species live and grow. In fact, it's a really quality nursery habitat for those really nice environmental conditions I mentioned earlier. And so a lot of young marine life live and grow in the bay and in the different ecosystems in the bay. And so for examples, obviously some of you may have seen this, uh, but we have turtles in the bay, we have bottlenose dolphin in the bay, we have manatees in the bay. These are some of our charismatic macrofauna that we regularly see in the bay. But uh, we also have other things too. We have uh, reef fish species. We have pelagic fish species that come into the bay to uh, reproduce and grow before moving back offshore. 
and those types of things. So uh, the different habitats in the bay, which I'm going to talk about more in depth, provide this really great nursery habitat, which is why it's really important to protect. So let's talk first about coral reefs. There are three primary marine habitats in South Florida, the first of which is coral reefs working outward inward. The next is seagrass beds and seagrass meadows. And the final is mangrove ecosystems in our shorelines. Uh, so let's talk about coral reefs first. The Florida Reef Tract is the third largest barrier reef in the world. So many of you have heard of the Great Barrier Reef. Well, guess what? We're only third in line, right? It's a pretty big deal what we have here. The reef track extends all the way north from Palm Beach County down south, all the way through the Keys and, and out west, and it extends over 170 miles. And the reef track itself is four miles wide and is often split up into uh, inner, middle, and outer reef, depending on the area that you're in. And of course, there are different types of reef, reef ecosystems. We have the barrier reef, but we also have a pretty healthy patch reef um, uh, community as well. And so as you can see, the Florida Reef Track extends downward like this. And there have been some impacts, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. This map in particular shows uh, where the Port of Miami shipping channel was dredged right through the reef tract a few years ago, um, out, just out by Government Cut, and the proposed shipping channel for Port Everglades. And so Miami Waterkeeper does a lot of work protecting our reefs, and we make sure that when they are doing these dredging projects, they're not harming the reef. Um, as much as they have in the past. Um, and another thing to point out about coral reefs is that we have listed species out on our coral reefs. And coral reefs, as you may know, have declined dramatically um, since the 1970s. In fact, they've declined by over 70% globally, which is a really huge impact. And for, that's for a number of reasons. The primary reason is, of course, climate change, changing climatic conditions and um, ocean conditions have really contributed to the decline. So we see increase in ocean acidification really impacts our reefs. It increases in temperature, changes in salinity, um, physical breakage from increase in, in frequency and intensity of storms um, that are associated with climate change. So our hurricanes physically break the reef. Um, and this creates a lot of problems because our reefs are in fact more biodiverse than rainforests. And so when you start breaking the reefs and then when, when the reefs start dying off, uh, you're really reducing habitat, really critical habitat for a lot of species that live in this ecosystem. And our reefs provide a great, uh, great habitat for a, a variety of different species, of course. So a lot of fish species, um, you know, lobsters, sharks, octopus, you name it, things live on the reef and they thrive on the reef because in part it creates this really great structure for critters to hide under and to live on. And of course, the reefs themselves um, accumulate things like algae, which some fish eat. They accumulate a lot of prey fish, with, which other fish eat, um, and numerous different things, but it does provide shelter. And some of the reef building species that we have, the reef building corals that we have, provide a lot better structure than others. And so you'll see here, this is a reef building coral. Does anybody know the name of this coral? Staghorn. staghorn coral, exactly. So our staghorn coral is actually a listed species. <laughs> it's actually a listed species here uh, in the United States, and so they're they're threatened right now on the on the Endangered Species Act, um, and that's for a number of reasons: the climatic changes I was mentioning earlier, but also because of the way that they reproduce. So staghorn coral reproduce both sexually and asexually, and so. When the staghorn coral get too far apart from each other when they spawn, they're no longer able to reproduce because the distance is just too great. And so as the impacts to these corals increase, the distance apart that they grow apart also increases and then inherently they're unable to reproduce. And so historically in South Florida, we used to have acres, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of acres of staghorn thickets. So these corals are really great reef building corals because they used to interlock and create these what are called thickets. And under those thickets, hundreds of different types of fish species and other species would live and thrive because it provides this great level of shelter and protection over the habitat. 
Uh, as you can see, this is a little baby thicket. It's trying really hard to grow. Uh, but in the past, these thickets would grow anywhere from uh, two to five feet tall and would just blanket the ocean floor. Um, today, we don't see that very frequently. Most recently, there was a discovery of a few remaining massive staghorn thickets off the coast of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, I cannot disclose the location of that uh, because they're trying to really protect it and study it at this time to see why this exact population has been able to thrive despite all of these environmental threats that we've seen, uh, not just in South Florida, but on, in unreef populations across the world. So the next ecosystem we're gonna talk about is seagrass beds. Seagrasses um, are often confused with algae, but they are in fact a grass species. They flower, they grow just like grasses. Uh, there's several, I think, I think there's over 70, 75 types of seagrasses um, across the globe. But here in South Florida, we have a few that are really prominent. We have shoal grass, we have Johnston seagrass, which is a listed species. We have manatee grass, turtle grass, and, and a few others. Um, but you can see them here, and they provide really great habitat for a lot of nursery species as well. On top of that, they help with filter water clarity, so they keep, they bring down sedimentation and they hold that sedimentation down in their roots. They also are really important for nutrient cycling. So we're gonna talk a little bit about nutrient cycling when we get to mangroves, but these uh, seagrasses, many scientists believe, help to transition nutrients from the mangrove ecosystem to the seagrass beds and then out to the coral reefs, which is really important. Um, and some common species that we have in Biscayne Bay that live in seagrass beds include, of course, our, our seahorses, which we love so much. Mangroves. Uh, this is one of my favorite topics. I am sort of a mangrove freak. I love mangroves. Um, they're, and that's for a number of reasons, but they're really important for our ecosystems as well. So in South Florida, we have three species of true mangroves. True mangroves are defined by a number of factors, but for now, let's just say that they are very salt tolerant species. They are viviparous which is a really fancy word that means that they germinate on the tree so that when they leave uh, the seed, when the seed leaves the tree, it's already germinated, so it's ready to go. It's uh, as if it's growing already, which is why many of you might have seen um, the very familiar looking propagules roll up on our beaches on Key Biscayne. Propagules are, in fact, mangrove seeds, but they're not just seeds, they're little trees that are already growing. So sometimes when you pick them up on the beach, you might see they have roots and leaves on them already, because that's how they grow. Um, and so our, our mangrove species, um, like I was saying, we're, are defined by a few things, but our true mangroves, and this is the most important thing, is that are the red mangroves, black mangroves, and white mangroves, so here. We also have a false mangrove in South Florida, which is commonly used in landscaping. I'm On the way here, I saw several of these. It's called a buttonwood tree, uh, and they're commonly mistaken for mangroves and upland mangrove species that in fact are not a mangrove species. They're in a, in the, let's say, shoreline plant community, but they are not a mangrove. Uh, but they'll commonly find them intermixed with mangrove, uh, mangrove stands. Now, as you can see by this graph, or not graph, this image, mangroves um, have different levels of water tolerance. So the most water tolerant species are the red mangroves. And those are the mangroves that have the really long prop roots that you might see along our shorelines. And those red mangroves are the ones that have the long propagules that fall off and you'll find washed up on the beach. The next you have black mangroves. Black mangroves um, have also very distinct roots um, called nematophores. And the nematophores come up out of the ground like spikes. So when you're walking in a, or if you're boating, if you're walking, whatever you're doing, you can look and you can start to identify these different types of mangrove species just based on their roots. Some people say, oh, all mangroves look the same, but the reality is, is that they're very distinct and the white mangroves barely have any type of roots at all. So that's a really good way to be able to distinguish is by looking at root shape rather than at leaf shape like you might with another type of tree species. Mangroves form really, really important ecosystems along Biscayne Bay. They provide a lot of what's called shoreline stabilization. 
So they, in those big prop roots of the red mangroves, they hold a, a bunch of sediment and they protect us from wave action that we experience. And of course, the other ecosystems, the coral reef ecosystems and the seagrass ecosystems serve a very similar purpose. Of coral reefs, we say, act as sort of a speed bump to big ocean waves coming into shore. But seagrasses do serve a similar function. And of course, mangroves are the last resort. They're really the final barrier to wave action along our shorelines. And historically, in South Florida, our shorelines were completely coated in mangroves. So when you think of Miami and you think white sand beaches, that's not the case. That is not a natural ecosystem here in South Florida. That's a man-made ecosystem. Of course, um, there are some areas, sandbars and those type of things that have surfaced over time due to currents and, and all of that and, wind, um, and the force of the wind, but that's a little bit different. At the end of the day, we're supposed to have a really swampy, stinky mangrove shoreline. Mangroves often um, are considered an eyesore uh, in different coastal communities. One, because they block the view, and two, because they smell. How many of you have smelled a mangrove before? You, they have a distinct smell, right? And that's because the leaves from the mangroves fall into the water, and they decompose in the water, the, the leaves do, which might be a little stinky smelling, but really what that decomposition is doing is it's allowing a land-based source of nutrient, the leaves from the tree, to enter a water source. And that's really important. And that's how nutrient cycling starts in this ecosystem. So when the mangrove leaves fall into the ocean, they start to decompose and all those good things that are in the mangrove leaves, the phosphorus, the different types of nutrients, the good types of nutrients enter the waterways and they serve as sort of like a fertilizer for the seagrass beds that create this really great habitat and the species that live there move out to the reefs. It's all very interconnected. And so if you care about coral reefs in this community, you really need to care about mangroves in this community. And you really need to care about seagrasses in this community because they're all very interconnected. This begs the question of how useful is this type of shoreline for protecting all those different ecosystems I talked about. Probably not very useful, right? This is a seawall, right? And we all see this manatee swimming along the seawall. It looks pretty happy. But the reality is, is that there's a lush green grass right up against the edge of the seawall. And there is no way for, for species to move in and out of that ecosystem. And there's no way for nutrients to cycle in that ecosystem. And in fact, the nutrients that are cycling in that ecosystem are coming from stormwater runoff from this overly fertilized green grass lawn right up against the edge of the bay. And that's not good for the animals that live in the bay, and that's not good for the ecosystems in the bay. So now let's talk about the fun stuff, what we get to do at Miami Waterkeeper. Uh, so there are a lot of environmental challenges, and I'm going to talk about three today. The first of which is changes in freshwater flow. Then I'm going to talk about pollution problems that we see in South Florida, and finally climate change impacts. So uh, first things first, a history of the Everglades. So, I, I don't know how many of you are from South Florida, but just to give a brief overview, our watersheds in South Florida are very, very interconnected. And it all starts up at the headwaters of Lake Okeechobee. So if you look at this map, you'll see the Kissimmee River to the north. It's a very interconnected system of lakes, streams, rivers. Uh, and historically, those rivers would filter fresh water down into Lake Okeechobee. Lake Okeechobee would then slowly overflow in the rainy season and would filter that water down into the Everglades, which is this ecosystem over here. Over time, people started to colonize south of Lake Okeechobee. And during the rainy season, those people would get flooded out of their homes. And so the state came in finally and said, people are dying. We can't have this lake flood at, on a whim. We have to be able to control the flow of Lake Okeechobee to protect this really important agriculture industry we have south of the lake. And as you can imagine, it's a really healthy agriculture ecosystem too, right? Because it's had all this freshwater flow slowly flowing over the land over you know millions of years and creating um, really fertile soil in this area. So that's why there's a lot of agricultural activity south of the lake. So over time, 
they decided to what we call channelize the flow of Lake Okeechobee. So they built a dike around the lake, the Hoover Dike, and they started to channelize the flow. So instead of flowing down into the Everglades and really providing the fresh water into Florida Bay, the Gulf of Mexico, and Biscayne Bay, where we are, they decided to channelize it out the Caloosahatchee and Kissimmee Rivers and then through a system of canals and then just barely down into the South Everglades and into Florida Bay. So what this has caused over time is a water-starved ecosystem. And that sounds so crazy because there's so much water in Florida. But when I say water-starved, I mean fresh water-starved. We're no longer receiving the quantity and the flow of fresh water that we have historically. And that has really changed ecosystem dynamics in South Florida. Not only has it changed ecosystem dynamics, it's impacted the rate at which our aquifer recharges. In Florida, we have, in South Florida, we have a sole source of drinking water called the Biscayne Aquifer. It's a superficial aquifer, and what it does is water flows over that aquifer and trickles down over time and makes a really, really clean source of drinking water for us all. In fact, when Miami-Dade County drinking water is tested against bottled water, our water is cleaner and more balanced on the pH scale. So keep that in mind when people, you see these reports that water quality in Florida is, you know, going downhill. So, as I was saying, the freshwater flow has really decreased over time, and Biscayne Bay has been especially <coughs> freshwater starved, especially freshwater starved. Historically, pirates would come into Biscayne Bay and fill up their freshwater stores because we had so many freshwater springs in South Florida, in Biscayne Bay. There were freshwater springs. We used to have crawfish in the bay. We used to have freshwater oysters in the bay. And in fact, the freshwater flow coming from Lake Okeechobee was so strong that we had white water rapids on the Miami River. And that is a fact. Go to a History Miami tour. They'll tell you all about it. It's really cool. So uh, the flow has really decreased over time. And that's created problems, right? So what happens is, is when the freshwater flow decreases, the salt water flow does not. So if the freshwater lens, as they call it, the pressure coming from Lake Okeechobee decreases. And over time, what that means is that salt water pushes, 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 and eventually the freshwater doesn't come anymore because the pressure is not strong enough to break into the bay. And so what that means for Biscayne Bay is that we have this estuary, this mixing of salt and fresh water, but in reality today, Biscayne Bay is pretty much as salty as the Atlantic Ocean itself, for the most part. And in fact, in some places, especially in places like Florida Bay that are also freshwater starved, uh, we've seen very dramatic die-offs. And we've seen hypersalinity, we've seen die-offs of fish, we've seen dramatic algae blooms, and of course, uh, we've seen seagrass die-offs as well from these salinity changes. Um, if anybody cares, um, this is the, the plan that's currently being contemplated uh, in, in the state Senate. They do want to restore the natural flow to some degree. Um, we can talk about that more in depth, but essentially uh, environmentalists are advocating for a land by south of the lake so that we can re-channelize the flow back south to the Everglades to help um, bring back the natural ecosystems as they were. Changes in freshwater flow mean changes in salinity and nutrient levels, and that affects all different kinds of species. Because species have to maintain a stasis at certain salinity levels, and they can't survive beyond that threshold. And so when things get too salty in the bay, it pushes different species out. So as I was mentioning, we used to have a lot of freshwater species in the bay, and today we have fewer freshwater species, or we have freshwater species that are more adapted to brackish water and saltwater environments. Next issue that I'm going to talk about is pollution problems. So, um, as I was saying before, we at Miami Waterkeeper work really hard to provide swimmable, drinkable, and fishable water. And this issue right here is something that we grapple with every single day. And how many of you have heard of uh, the Flint water crisis in Flint, Michigan? How many of you think that we should not be having water quality problems with our drinking water and our ocean water. 
I mean, probably not, right? This is 2017. We shouldn't be having sewage leaks and uh, pollution problems and water contamination happening in this day and age. It seems like we have enough technology, enough oversight to sort of preemptively uh, react to those situations. But the reality is, is that we do have a lot of water quality issues and we have water quality issues in, this, in the Bay. And I don't want to scare any of you, but I do want to make you aware of what's going on in the Bay. So Miami Waterkeeper was founded in 2010. In 2012, we brought our first lawsuit against the county because the county was dumping accidentally millions of gallons of raw sewage into Biscayne Bay. How many of you were living here in 2012? How many of you knew that raw sewage was being put in the bay in 2012? It's a problem, right? There's a real awareness problem. Yes. How do they accidentally do that without knowing that? That's a great question. So, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> so it's not that they didn't know about it. Uh, they knew about it. The problem is that there was really aging infrastructure. So when Miami was built originally, and the sewage system was installed in Miami, it had not been updated and it had not been maintained. And so what happened was pipes started to burst, uh, cracks in pipes started to occur because it's just really, really old. In Miami, we have what's called an ocean outfall system for our sewage. So that means we have three primary sewage treatment plants. The water from your homes goes to this sewage treatment plants, it's treated there, and then it's pumped out into the ocean. Unfortunately, <laughs> one of our sewage treatment plants is located on Virginia Key. So how do you get the raw sewage from the mainland to Virginia Key? Pipes. Underwater. Pipes. Underwater pipes. Exactly. And so when these underwater pipes get really old and they break and they explode, um, where does that raw sewage go before it's treated at the plant that's on the island? <laughs> It goes into the bay. And so, so we've been having a lot of issues um, over time with basically redoing our sewage infrastructure here in Miami. And these problems persist. Even last year, um, leaks were spotted in, in Biscayne Bay. And um, they're being addressed, And but it took a lawsuit to make that happen, unfortunately. The county at the time didn't think it was necessary to appropriate the funding to address these sewage infrastructure problems. And eventually the EPA came in and they said, you know what, it's not an option anymore. This is a human health problem. You cannot continue to let these leaks happen. They issued what's called a consent decree, which is basically uh, a stipulated settlement that requires the, the county to appropriate a certain amount of funding to address sewage infrastructure problems uh, throughout the county over uh, the next few years. Um, and that's what they're doing, and they are doing, they are trying, but there is, as you can imagine, a lot of sewage infrastructure in Miami and in South Florida, so it's taking a long time, and in the process there have been some leaks. Um, another really big issue that we have, oh, I did want to make a pitch that if you're ever concerned about water quality in Biscayne Bay, Miami Waterkeeper, if you go online to our website, we have um, a link up there called Swim Guide, and we have been able to populate a map of the beaches in South Florida <clears throat> uh, that have swim advisories based on bacteria testing in the water. And so you can go, if you want to go swimming in the bay, and you can actually download the application on your phone and look before you go to see if there's a swim advisory issued or not. Because sometimes swim advisories look like this, and sometimes they're just little orange signs that are posted on a palm tree at the beach. So. Um, the beach is never blocked off completely to prevent people from entering the water. Uh, and so you guys, as residents, as citizens, have to be really aware of the water quality so that you're not going into the water when it's unsafe to swim. How often do they test the water? Uh, they test the water a few times a month. Uh, but recently, actually, <clears throat> we've been facing funding cuts from the county for water quality monitoring. And so... At Miami Waterkeeper, we've been partnering with an organization called Florida Sea Grant to institute a citizen science model like Rumio was talking about earlier to have citizens uh, contribute to that data source um, and to sort of bridge the gap in the data because um, it's really important uh, to evaluate the, the conditions of the water in that way. Okay.
So, how many of you drove on US-1 last week and had to see all the flooding that was on US-1, right? Um, it's pretty bad for a number of reasons, but where does that flooding or that flood water go? Where do you think it goes after the rain subside? Into the drainage pipes. Into the drainage pipes. And do you think those drainage pipes are filtered or cleaned in any way? Unfortunately not. They are not. That's correct. So they either go directly, eventually, into the bay through a system of outfall pipes. So we have all this dirty storm water that's being collected from increased intensity and frequency of storms and rain events. Just in the past 30 days, we broke a nearly 30 year record for heat and rainfall in South Florida. Tell that to our governor who doesn't believe that climate change is happening. It's happening and it's happening right now. And on top of that, we have sea levels that are slowly rising. Sea levels have risen by several inches over the past decade in South Florida, and that's a fact. And we're seeing it in Miami Beach regularly. They're already taking preemptive measures. They're raising the roads, they're installing stormwater pumps, but it's not enough. And that's because our king tides are coming in and we have king tides mixed with rain events, mixed with intrusion of water from the, from the groundwater coming up from below. There's a lot of water infiltrating our system and our infrastructure right now. And the thing about stormwater is, like I said, is that it's not clean. And there's no real system of treatment for our stormwater in Miami-Dade County. And as you can see, this is an example of a stormwater outfall pipe here. Um, and sometimes the water gushes through and sometimes it trickles, but either way, there are um, land-based sources of pollutants that are included in that stormwater. Yes? Uh, here on Key Biscayne, we have reverse stormwater runoff. We have a king tide and the waters are, are backing up. Oh, really? Stormwater. Yeah. It's becoming a, a really big problem in South Florida and something that definitely needs to be on the county's radar for addressing in the future. Um, but not only are we seeing land-based sources of pollution in our stormwater, so we are seeing a lot of trash in our stormwater that's entering the bay from this system, but we also see a lot of nutrient contamination from this system. So as I was mentioning before, these fertilizers that really help to keep our grasses nice and clean and our, and our lawns green and bright are actually filtering off into the bay. And these fertilizers are not coral friendly fertilizers. They're adding additional nutrients in excess, which is a process called eutrophication. And the eutrophication of this ecosystem might at first sound like a good thing. Oh, sure, well, Kelly, you just said nutrient cycling is so important for Biscayne Bay. Well, that's true, but natural nu nutrient cycling is important. Unnatural nutrient cycling from chemically made fertilizers is really bad for Biscayne Bay. And so we put that water into the bay and what do you think happens? Who knows what happens? We start to see increases algae. in algae. Now, Biscayne Bay has been experiencing the most severe algae bloom in recorded history over the past five to 10 years. Our algae bloom isn't the same kind of algae bloom that we've seen just a few uh, miles up the road and around the Indian River Lagoon. So we're not seeing the dramatic green-blue algae that's blanketing the lagoon up there and have, causing all these dramatic fish kills that we saw last summer, but we are seeing impacts. We're seeing algae starting to smother coral reefs. We're seeing algae starting to smother seagrass beds. It's taking over, and that's because there's too many artificial nutrients in the water. And as Romeo was saying, there's not enough circulation to filter that those nutrients out. So they're sort of sitting and concentrating and the algae is growing and it's changing the face of the ecosystem. So algae blooms are a problem for a number of reasons. They reduce water clarity, they damage seagrass, they reduce the ecological health of the bay. And as I was saying, unprecedented algae blooms. And in fact, here in South Florida, we are currently in the midst of a massive algae bloom that we think might be impacting our seagrass beds up on the, by the Julia Tuttle Causeway. So there's been a huge seagrass die up and nobody really knows why, but some scientists think <clears throat> that it's because of this excess eutrophication that's causing algae blooms in the water. And it's a massive die up Maybe you've read about it in the Herald. It's been covered pretty extensively recently. All right, let's talk about marine debris. This is a favorite issue in Key Biscayne. Let's see if this works. So this is a picture of 
marine debris found in Miami-Dade County. This ecosystem is a mangrove ecosystem, as you can see. Mangroves, like I said, are really good at trapping sediment, and they keep that stagnant water in their roots. But they're also really good at trapping trash. And what, what did, let's watch this again if we can. Wait, what do you think the primary pollution for marine debris is? What's the primary source? Plastic. Plastics, exactly. Plastics are a huge problem in South Florida for our marine ecosystems. Plastics included in that umbrella term is styrofoam. Styrofoam and plastics do not degrade. They photodegrade over time, and scientists are unsure if they'll ever degrade at all. They're made from fossil fuels, as you know, and our economy and our culture now relies on this disposable um, mode of food and drink transportation, item transportation, that um, eventually just ends up in the bay. This is a problem. Because, as I was saying, these photodegrade over time, which means they just break into smaller and smaller pieces. And that creates a problem for a number of reasons. One, these microplastics are often consumed by species of fish and wildlife. Um, they're often found in the bellies of seabirds and, in, uh, like I was saying, fish species. In fact, many commercial fishermen say that if you gut uh, any type of fish that you catch, it's almost a guarantee that you will find plastic in the belly of that fish. So this begs a, a, a question of, how, is, how are the toxins from the plastic bioaccumulating in the fish? This is a question, a scientific question that's relatively unstudied. Yes? If, if it doesn't biodegrade, how, how come it produces toxins? If it, it, it shouldn't produce toxins, right? If it's not biodegraded. Sure. Well, it photodegrades. So as it photodegrades, so as light degrades it, it breaks into these tiny, tiny pieces and the toxins are able to escape that way. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, what I was saying was, over time, these plastics accumulate in fish, but it's unstudied how those fish accumulate toxins from the plastics in them, and then we eat those fish. And so, there's this chain of events where it's relatively unstudied as to how fish-consuming plastics impacts human health. It's a legitimate question. It, we're putting these fish into our bodies, for those of us who eat fish, um, and we don't really know. And so it's sort of a risk that we're, we're taking right now, um, and something that really should be studied. Not to mention um, that there are a, a number of very easy solutions to our plastic problem. Plastics didn't really come on the scene in, uh, in a commercial way, uh, you know, until the 60s and 70s. And so, how did we live our day-to-day -day lives prior to that? How could we possibly? I mean, it, for some people it really is unfathomable, but the reality is is that people in the past used a lot of reusable options. When you go to the coffee store, or the, the coffee shop, you use a mug and you don't use a paper cup or a styrofoam cup. When you go to the grocery store, you bring your old burlap bags or you bring your reusable bags and you don't use the single-use carry-out bags. Right now, interestingly, tonight, and I invite you all to attend, there is a village council meeting about this very issue on Key Biscayne. And the village council is going to be considering a resolution, um, which is not a binding law yet, to take the first initial steps. They moved it to the 20th. Okay. They discussed it on the 20th. Oh, great. Okay, so the 20th. Um, but they are going to discuss the initial steps to... Um, instituting a ban on styrofoam and plastic, single-use plastic bags on Key Biscayne. And that might sound like a lot for business owners, but the reality is the plastic bag's lifespan, on average, is 12 minutes. 12 minutes. And people use individually hundreds and hundreds of plastic bags every year. And just in this room alone, if I use, let's say, over 200 plastic bags, and everybody else uses over 200 plastic bags, and those bags eventually end up in landfills or the ocean, if we don't, it's just a never-ending cycle. We have to figure out some way, whether it be an incentive program or um, mandatory ordinances or whatever it may be, to really stop this, this trend. Because obviously this marine debris problem is not going away. And in fact, on Key Biscayne, we regularly do cleanups with Miami Waterkeeper on Key Biscayne. And we noticed when we, I have two of my junior ambassadors here today, and the last cleanup that we did, we picked up pieces of plastic 
um, that were actually water bags from Haiti that were uh, sent to Haiti as a part of their relief program. And so plastics not only are a problem from our own actions here in Miami, but they're a problem on a global scale because of the way that our currents move, um, particularly the Gulf Stream Current, which is our primary current along South Florida. Um, so the next, the final issue I'm going to talk about is is climate change impacts. So climate change exacerbates already difficult environmental impacts that we have in South Florida. It causes changes in temperature, changes in salinity, uh, and results in ocean acidification. How many of you know what this is a picture of right here? Who can tell me what that's a picture of? Coral bleaching. Coral bleaching, exactly. Does anyone know what coral bleaching is? Yeah? It's when the coral starts to die. Mm -hmm. So coral bleaching is essentially when a coral uh, gets really sick. So corals have a have a really interesting sort of symbiotic relationship um, with uh, a microscopic organism called a zooxanthellae. And the zooxanthellae is the thing that gives the coral its color. And the coral builds this calcareous skeleton and the zooxanthellae lives inside the coral. But when the coral gets sick and when ocean conditions change, the zooxanthellae exit. They say, no way, I'm not staying here, this is not a good environment for me, and they leave. And that's what results in coral bleaching. So right here what you're seeing is a skeleton, and in theory, um, the zooxanthellae can recolonize this coral if conditions return back to normal, but the reality is, is that rarely ever happens. And so once the coral starts bleaching, it has been, and the, that means the zooxanthellae have left, uh, it's sort of the equivalent of the coral losing its immune system. So it makes the coral really susceptible to disease and to death, ultimately. And so what, that's why coral bleaching is a really big problem. It doesn't mean coral death per se, but it means extreme coral sickness. And so climate change really contributes to that. And as our corals die off, as I mentioned before, we see a really de uh, a decrease in the biodiversity of our coral reefs, which, as I mentioned earlier, are a really important habitat here in South Florida. So let's talk a little bit about sea level rise. This is an artist's rendition of uh, Miami Beach and, and uh, sea level rise in Miami Beach. Some people, you may have listened to a political banter on this issue. Some people say, oh, Miami Beach, let's just make it the next Venice. You know, everybody get around by boat, it'll be totally fine. In fact, it'll be great because it'll be a tourist destination and people will wanna come and we'll have actual gondolas and we'll just pull people through Miami Beach and you can snorkel the bottom of the fountain blue. Like, this is what people are saying on the political spectrum. And they made this beautiful artist rendition of, oh look, there's gonna be people boating in these different areas. Unfortunately, that's not exactly the reality. Because sea level rise water looks more like this. It's flood water, as I mentioned before. And flood water is not clean, and it's not healthy, and it has a lot of contaminants in it, it's got oil from your car in it. It has actual trash in it. All types of things that are found on people's properties, like you name it. As that sea of seawater comes across a property, um, that's what composes this type of flood water, and it's really not as appealing to boat on or uh, snorkel in, I would say. So I think that's sort of a, a false perspective on what we're doing with sea level rise in Miami is that, oh, we're just going to adapt and it's going to be fun and everyone's going to be happy. But the reality is, is that we have to take actual measures to address this um, because it's not going to be a very pretty sight. But as I mentioned, this is happening already. These are the, the flood zones in Miami Beach, as you can see. And um, this is an example of a road elevation project. But sea level rise is already impacting businesses on Miami Beach. Um, this is right along the beach, and you can see that during this uh, storm event, waters were coming all the way up to the shoreline. And that's a really big problem for these businesses um, and for our economy in general in South Florida. We like to say that our economy in South Florida is a clean water economy. It's something like, something like over 80% of our tourists, when they come to South Florida, spend days in the water. 
And our tourism industry is huge in this area. And so <clears throat> it's really important that we are giving the tourists really positive water experiences. And needless to say, I don't think that's a very positive water experience. These restaurants and hotels are being flooded. People have to sandbag their doors. It's a very real problem that's, that my Beach is facing and that, in fact, other places are facing as well. Excuse me, low-lying areas all along the shoreline of the bay are actually experiencing similar problems. They're just not taking as much action as Miami Beach on this issue. And so it's in the future, and I mean in the next <laughs> two or three years, we really need to jump on the ball with helping with rezoning, moving people out of these areas that are going to be really susceptible to flooding. Um, because in the end of the day, it's going to create a lot more costs for us uh, than benefit if we don't address this issue um, face on. All right, let's talk a little bit about our drinking water. So as we mentioned before, our drinking water comes from the Biscayne Aquifer. Uh, we have a very, very porous limestone bedrock here in South Florida. And here's a picture of what it sort of looks like. And our drinking water filters through this, this rock, which is some of it ancient coral reef that has been compressed and solidified over time. And our water trickles down and it gets really, really clean. Uh, so we, as I mentioned before, we have a wastewater disposal system. So <clears throat> this is a really great graphic. It shows where you get your water from in the Biscayne Aquifer. It shows where we are also getting water from in the Floridan Aquifer, which is our secondary aquifer that is a sort of brackish water aquifer. So some communities um, like Everglades City and places out in Collier County are already using Floridan aquifer water to be pulled out and treated and um, desalinized. And then of course, uh, one controversial water treatment issue that we face in Miami-Dade County is deep injection of wastewater into what's called the boulder zone. So this really deep layer of rock um, that essentially the county treats this wastewater and instead of pumping it out via ocean outfall, it's going to pump it down into the ground. And that creates a number of issues for us. And namely because we think it's great that the county a few years ago passed an ordinance that says we are going to eliminate our ocean outfall system by 2025, which is coming up quick. So they have to figure out what they're gonna do with the wastewater that's generated in South Florida. So what they've decided recently is that they're going to deep well inject it. But as I mentioned before, when you deep well inject wastewater into a porous limestone bedrock, do you think that that water is gonna remain contained in that layer? Probably not, right? So in fact, scientists have studied this and it's called a confinement layer. And it's sort of disputed whether or not that water is gonna remain in this boulder zone. So we're starting to see a lot of issues related to wastewater disposal in South Florida too. Uh, this is another example of how um, how far this is how far our aquifer goes up north and down south. Um, but also, this this image explains how deep well injection of wastewater can also cause vertical intrusion, like you were saying, of water back up through those pipes and up through those fissures, um, causing saltwater intrusion, which in due time will impact the salinity of our aquifer. So let's talk about Turkey Point. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, Turkey Point, how many of you have heard of Turkey Point nuclear power plant? Great. Uh, Turkey Point is situated right here uh, in between Everglades National Park and Biscayne National Park. How many of you knew that it was situated between two national parks? How many of you know that Turkey Point sits on top of our sole source of drinking water? <laughs> Great. Uh, and so Turkey Point has had a number of problems over the years, but to give you a brief overview, uh, back in the 1960s, Turkey Point uh, established its first oil combustion uh, power plants. And those power plants were built, and the cooling water from those power plants was drawn directly from Biscayne Bay. And so um, it's actually right here, if any of you can see this, this used to be the cooling line. Um, from the power plant and it would be pumped out directly into Biscayne Bay and pump water from, bay, from the bay pumped back in. 
The thing about adding really hot water to Biscayne Bay from a power plant is that it's going to absolutely decimate the seagrass population. As I mentioned before, these species have to maintain a stasis in the environment. And when you change an environmental condition too dramatically, you're going to experience some environmental problems. In this case, there was a massive seagrass die from this event. So environmentalists got together and they demanded that FPL shut off um, that canal for, for cooling for their power plant. And so FPL said, okay, we'll shut it off. We know it's causing a lot of problems. Um, but at the same time, they wanted to build the first two nuclear power plants at this site in South Florida. And the idea initially was that they were also going to use the bay water to cool uh, the nuclear power plants, which are called Units 3 and 4. Instead, environmentalists worked together with FPL and they said maybe a better option is to create what's known as the cooling canal system. The cooling canal system is about a seven square mile area of canals that act as a radiator. And for those of you who aren't familiar with nuclear power plants or power plants in general, what they do essentially at this site is they use a heating source, in this case a nuclear core, to heat a bunch of water. And that water creates steam, the steam turns a turbine, and the turbine creates energy. So it's essentially a really fancy steam engine that we're dealing with at Turkey Point. But the reality is, is that once that really hot water goes and is heated, it needs a place to cool off. And so the cooling canals were created to serve as sort of a radiator system for the water to travel through these miles and miles and miles of cooling canals and eventually cool off enough to be re-sucked up by the nuclear power plant to use as cooling water again. This is the idea in theory. <laughs> in practice, we've had a lot of problems. So there is a like ongoing working arrangement between the park and Turkey Point, but they're not, they are abutting lands, but they are not the same land. So it's not like Turkey Point was grandfathered in, and in fact there are a lot of lawsuits going on right now about the environmental degradation at Turkey Point. So um, I don't want to make FPL the villain here of this story, but the reality is, is that they sort of are. And FPL's Turkey Point plant is one of the biggest threats to our sole source of drinking water in South Florida right now. And here's why. So this cooling canal system I explained um, originally had this red boundary, which is, you can sort of see, it's called the G3 boundary. So they, what, what FPL did back in the 1970s was they were like, you know, here's a good theory. We're going to dig the canals to a certain depth. And then we're going to dig what's called an interceptor ditch along the outer edge of the canal. So, in theory, to prevent the westward migration of any water from the canal system into the drinking water well fields that populate Homestead and South Dade. So they knew ahead of time that this water in this canal was going to travel. Today, FPL says that this is a closed loop system, that no water is leaving this site. Just a few years ago, Scientists um, were able to take some samples of water from these various drinking water wellheads, which are seen in green here, and they sampled them. And when they sampled them, they found tritium. Tritium is a radioactive isotope. Uh, and it's not dangerous to human consumption, but it is a tracer and an indicator that water from <coughs> this plant has gone as far out as the Homestead Speedway. Has anybody ever been out to the Homestead Speedway? Yeah. Several miles away. So the water from this plant, this contaminated water from the cooling canal system, which is hypersaline, has a lot, a very high concentration of chemicals and other nutrients and dangerous concentrations, is now slowly migrating about 1.8 feet per day westward. And this creates a problem. Because, as I mentioned before, the Biscayne Aquifer and the wellheads are located in this area. And so once uh, FPL breaches the Biscayne Aquifer completely, that water is going to be contaminated. And so what a lot of environmental groups now are doing is trying to uh, force FPL to decommission the cooling canal system. It's out of date. It's the only cooling canal system like it in the entire world. It has not been adequately tested. It's not adequately operated and maintained. And they need to decommission it. And in fact, 
They should not be permitted to build two more nuclear reactors as they have proposed on this site, um, which is a process they're trying to get the licensing for right now. How many reactors are there now? Two reactors right now. Well, two nuclear reactors right now. Of course. Yeah. Um, so they actually have six total reactors, so six total generating units on site. Um, so they're trying to decommission these canals and make sure that um, this is this site is transitioned hopefully into an ecological restoration site because interestingly enough, Turkey Point nuclear power plant cooling canals are um, lay claim to one of the highest concentrations of the threatened American crocodile in the United States. So there are three primary nesting locations for the threatened American crocodile, one of which, and the biggest of which, is Turkey Point Power Plant. Obviously, um, obviously they like warm water. They like warm water. Um, and it is also, they love mm -hmm. it when it gets cold. Yep. So one of the things that they like in particular is that the, the canal system creates these berms, which are really good for crocodile nesting. Unfortunately, um, Turkey Point has had a myriad of problems with its canals, which have contributed to the contaminated nature of the canal system, um, including they asked for what's called a variance to increase the generating capacity of the plant in 2008. Um, and so they started operating the plant at a higher temperature and pumping out a lot more energy. And as a result, it created a massive algae bloom within the canal system. And if you go onto Google Earth or Google Maps and you like click back a few years, you can actually see this thick coat of green algae that blankets the canal system. And so what that did was created a lot of problems for the ecosystem, right? Because this is not a contained system. So this uh, contamination has slowly been leaching out westward, and in fact, now into Biscayne Bay itself, and in the process has resulted in the death of a lot of American crocodiles. In fact, the crocodile nesting population went from 25 nests in 2014 to five nests today. It's a very dramatic decline, and it's actually a really big problem because, as I said, it's the largest nesting population. It's a threatened species, and the only place that this species lives in the United States is in here in South Florida. So, something interesting to consider. Uh, this is the proposed new reactor, uh, units six and seven. They're supposed to be uh, nuclear reactors as well. Uh, in theory, they're going to be um, instead of relying on the canal system, they're going to have cooling towers. Um, this is a really complex and difficult issue because, as I mentioned before, Miami County is attempting to um, find a way to use its wastewater. So, as I mentioned before, they're trying to deep well inject it, but another alternative for the county could be to pump wastewater down to Turkey Point for cooling water for these new reactors. So, the county has been pretty you know, lenient and on board with this new project. Unfortunately, Miami Waterkeeper is not lenient and on board with this project because we don't feel that we should be building two new nuclear reactors right on the edge of Biscayne Bay. And in fact, um, these new reactors in their proposal do not consider sea level rise or storm surge to the extent that we think is appropriate. Uh, and so we don't think that they're safe and, um, and we, we really think that uh, this project needs to be stopped um, in fact, how many of you have ever heard of Fukushima? So a few years ago, in 2011, uh, there was a reactor in Japan called Fukushima, and it had a meltdown. And the reason it had a meltdown... Three, three, three reactors melted down. Yeah, so... We still don't know where they are. There's disasters going on. People think it's right. over, but it's never it's not, over. Yeah, it's, it's still ongoing. Deep. And so they, so they had this meltdown, and the reason they had this meltdown is because not because the reactor itself melted down, but because the cooling system for the reactor was infiltrated by storm surge. Think, let that sit for a minute. It was impacted by storm surge. So the storm yeah, surge it was, it knocked down. It was a tsunami, it was not storm surge. Right, exactly. It was, it was surge from the tsunami, exactly. So the same thing happens for us. The equivalent is a hurricane. And so these increased wave heights will come in and impact the plant that is not adequately prepared for sea level rise or storm surge. And it's going to wipe out the cooling system at the new plant. <clears throat> now, the evacuation zone for in the event that this happens goes all the way to the Florida Keys and all the way up to Pompano Beach. So you tell me, where are people going to go in South Florida? 
avoid being the boy who cried wolf on this issue. We're just trying to prevent the plants from being built altogether. Um, we don't think it's appropriate right now. And in fact, the population growth of South Florida is reaching a, a steady rate of growth. Um, and so there's not really an increased need for generating capacity in South Florida right now. Um, in fact, there's been some talk of using the power that's generated at these new plants and pumping it up to uh, Orlando. So we'd be impacted, our environment would be impacted, our backyard would be impacted, but we're not even getting the generating capacity in our own homes. Um, here's an interesting uh, piece of information. And I guess not, not to mention also that we have been paying for these power plants six and seven, the ones that are, have not been built yet since 2008. Um, so we've paid as ratepayers over $280 million to FPL for these plants already. Um, and FPL does not have to pay that money back. So let's talk about future outlook and what we can do. Because this all sounds like a lot of doom and gloom and a lot of problems. Um, so what can you do? Biscayne Bay is a healthy ecosystem. It's a changing ecosystem, but it is a healthy ecosystem. But we are about to reach that tipping point. And so we need to make sure that we're really maintaining the stasis and the quality of our bay. So how do we do that? We have to continue to study the conditions of the bay. We have to do these citizen science projects. We have to continue funding water quality monitoring. Um, and on top of that, we need to really educate ourselves and our family about these issues. You need to speak to other people about these things. While the environment might not affect you directly, everybody is connected to it in some way. We all live in South Florida for a reason, and for me, that reason is my connection to the marine environment. But for everybody, there is some type of connection to our natural environment. And so there's always a way to be a steward of the environment when you're in a community situation, a family situation, a friend situation holding other people accountable. When you go to the store and you're buying um, you know, a, a, a pack of gum, do you really need a plastic bag? Does your friend really need a plastic bag? Just tell them, no, you don't need a plastic bag. Just carry it out and put it in your pocket. That type of thing. Small acts like that can really change a person's mentality on these issues. Other things you can do. Live your trash appropriately. Participate in cleanup events. Use eco-friendly landscaping, so native planting, uh, or reducing your fertilizer use on your property. Take steps to reduce your carbon footprint. Other things that you can do at Miami Waterkeeper, we um, have a very strong membership base. You can become a member of Miami Waterkeeper. We have a very low level membership option, but uh, by becoming a member of Miami Waterkeeper, you allow us to sue on your behalf. So you give us standing to do on these issues. So it's, it's, which is a really, really important piece of this puzzle is that we need people that are spread far and wide across the county and across Miami-Dade and Broward County that are members of our organization. So if we see an issue in an area, we can go ahead and take action on behalf of our members in that area. So you can become a member of Miami Waterkeeper. You can also um, sign an online petition. We have plenty of online petitions on our website that we regularly communicate to lawmakers and decision makers. We contribute to the public policy decision making process. We submit public comments on issues. There are tons of ways for you to get involved on our website. You can stay up to date on events. We have an events calendar. You can come to things like this and educate yourself, educate others. Uh, and of course, you can always, always, always call your elected officials and hassle them. It's one of my favorite things. I tell myself I need to call at least three elected officials a week. And so I set a, a little time in my calendar and I make a call and nine times out of ten I'm talking to an intern. But I let them know what I, what I, what I care about, what bills I'm concerned about, and um, that I expect them to be representing our best interests in South Florida on behalf of my waterkeeper. In fact, uh, I have a call uh, in just a few days with Senator Bill Nelson to talk about shark finning, of all things. So I'm um, looking forward to that. But this is something that everyone can do. Your representatives are here to represent you. And we're going to be talking about this more in the next advocacy training. So how, how do you find your representatives? How do you contact them? When you do contact them, what are the right things to say? How do you know who the right representative is to talk to? Do you go to a park and you see there's a bunch of litter on the ground and there's no trash cans? Who do you call? Do you call Do you call Mayor Lindsay? Do you call your county commission? Do you call Parks and Rec? 
Do you need to call Marco Rubio and be like, Marco, listen, there's trash on this beach. Can I get a trash can? What do you need to do? What we're going to teach you at the next section is how you navigate that landscape and how you um, make those types of decisions and really get involved as an environmental advocate and a grassroots advocate in your community. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about that large amount of information I tossed at you. <laughs> Thanks. Quickly before we get into questions, um, if you guys want to get on our mailing list when I uh, send out emails about upcoming events, um, just write it down here for me. I'll leave this up here. And um, if you want to come to the future sessions, I have uh, flyers in the back that has the schedule of the other two sessions this summer. If you have specific questions or want to follow with me personally, um, my email is kelly at miamiwaterkeeper.org and I can uh, I have my cards up here so. Um, if you guys have any questions about the citizen science program at um, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, um, just grab one of the flyers at the back, my email's at the bottom of that. Awesome, <laughs> thanks guys.